morning, everyone. Good morning, saints in the hall, and those of you viewing this sermon on social media. This morning, I'm continuing with the theme that Brother Philip Scott shared last Sunday and Wednesday. The purpose for the return of Christ. The purpose for the return of Christ. The subject of the second coming of Christ is central in scriptures, both Old and New Testament. Many scripture passages have as their reference point the second coming of Christ. Not only is this event central in scriptures, it is the high point of end time events as human governments are dethroned by divine rule. The second coming of Christ is therefore both the culmination and fulmination of world history. Let us pause for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to speak about the second coming of Christ, the return of Christ to the world to complete the mission of establishing your kingdom on earth. Lord, we wait expectantly this morning to hear from you. Speak to your man's servant, we pray in Jesus' name. Brother Scott shared six reasons for Jesus' return to earth. They are one, to restore the original intent of God for mankind. Two, to fulfill prophetic scriptures. Three, to fulfill his own word that he would return. Four, to complete the program with his bride, the church. Five, to end corruption in the world. And six, to rule and reign on earth. I will share three additional reasons for the return of Jesus to the earth. One, Jesus must return to fulfill God's preordained plan. Two, Jesus must return to restore divine rule in Israel. And three, Jesus must return to establish the messianic kingdom. In the passage before us today, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 11, the writer Luke records a conversation between Jesus and his disciples after being with them for 40 days since his resurrection from the grave. Luke records in verse 6 that the disciples asked Jesus, Will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Jesus replied in verse 7, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. By this response, Jesus underscores the point that God himself, El Elyon, the master of the universe, has a plan and a timetable of events that are unfolding intentionally on the stage of world history. So based on this observation, my first point then is that Jesus must return because it is part of God's preordained plan. Jesus must return because it is part of God's preordained plan. In other words, Jesus must return because it's so God set the thing, we would say in Jamaican vernacular. From the perspective of eternity, Jesus has already returned. It's a done deal. But why do I draw this conclusion from Acts 1 verse 7? Why am I linking the Lord's return with God's preordained plan and timing. 
After all, Jesus did not make that explicit connection in his response to his disciples. Am I being faithful to the passage? I hear my keen listeners asking. Here's why I make the connection. As the conversation between Jesus and his disciples continues, he is suddenly caught up and ascends into the clouds, leaving his disciples in awe and bewilderment. They must have been thinking, what? The Messiah has gone back to heaven without setting up his kingdom as many Old Testament prophets had prophesied? If he is gone, then who will restore Israel's kingdom? I can hear Peter and John saying, and what about our positions in his kingdom? That should have been James and John. If you remember, their mom went to ask Jesus to have a special place in his kingdom for her two sons, James and John. So I can just imagine them seeing the Lord disappear thinking, what's going to happen to our position? These are the likely questions the disciples were pondering. Something must have gone wrong with God's plan to send a Messiah to rule. Is this mission aborted? Or is this mission accomplished? And as they stood there pondering, then two messengers from heaven appeared and famously declared in verse 11, Men of Galilee, why are you gazing up into the sky? This same Jesus who is taken from you into heaven shall return shall return as you see him depart shall return this i was have been saying shall return that was stated in the old testament prophets they said he would come and we expect when he when he came that he would have done all these things shall return realization and understanding flood the disciples Ah, the Messiah's mission is twofold. It is a twofold mission. He shall return to accomplish all that is required to establish the kingdom of God. Indeed, Peter makes the connection in Acts chapter 3, verse 21. He tells a crowd in Jerusalem. Heaven must receive him, Jesus, until the time comes for God. Until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. So it was no sinking through. There were no understanding why the Messiah, the Lord, disappeared from them. Jesus shall return because it is preordained by God and fixed on his calendar of global events that are sweeping across history. Christ's return to earth is not dependent on his Christ's own doing. It is not dependent on religious or denominational leaders. Christ's return is not dependent on the church and Christians fasting and praying for his return. No! Christ's return will happen, must happen, shall happen because God has set a time as only he, God, can and is empowered to do set a time for his son's return to earth to finish the unfinished business of establishing the kingdom of heaven on earth. Like all other end time events, Jesus must return to fulfill God's preordained plan. 
My second point is that Jesus must return to restore a theocratic government in Israel. Jesus must return to restore a theocratic government in, in Israel. That is a government that is direct rule by God. If you remember your scriptures, since the time of Moses, the Israeli people were ruled by leaders chosen or anointed by God. This ended when they were captured by the Babylonian Empire. Since then, Israel has been led by secular governments of their own or of conquering nations. But based on the declarations of several Old Testament prophets, religious Jews looked forward and continue to look forward to a time when the theocratic government will be restored in Israel. This perhaps is what the apostles were asking Jesus about in Acts 1 verse 6 when they asked, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? The prophet Isaiah talks about this in chapter 1 of his book, verse 26. I will restore your leaders as in days of old, your rulers at as at the beginning, afterward you will be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Prophet Zechariah takes up the same point and in, and in chapter 8 verse 3, Zechariah says, This is what the Lord says, I will return to Zion and dwell in Jerusalem. Then Jerusalem will be called the faithful city and the mountain of the Lord Almighty will be called the holy mountain. Hear Jer Jeremiah in chapter 3 verse 7. I will bring Judah and Israel back from captivity. And will rebuild them as they were before. The matter of the restoration of the theocratic government in Israel was of constant interest to the disciples, the twelve. If you remember, the mother of James and John had requested from Jesus a special position for her sons in his kingdom. On one occasion recorded in Matthew 19 verse 28, Jesus said to the disciples, Truly, I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. When will this happen? Matthew 25 verse 20, 31 indicates that Jesus will sit on his throne when he returns to earth. So when he returns to earth is when the disciples, the apostles, the disciples will be able to rule and judge with him. Jesus therefore must return to restore divine rule in Israel. He must return to restore divine rule in Israel just as how he must return because it's a part of the preordained plan of God. I move now to my third point. Jesus must return to establish the messianic kingdom. Jesus must return to establish the messianic kingdom. And on this point, I'm simply expanding a point previously made by a brother Scott in his presentation last week. When Christ returns, he will not only rule over Israel, but he will rule over all the nations of the earth. According to Revelation 11 verse 15, the seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven, 
which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah. And he will reign forever and ever. Let me repeat the verse. The kingdom of the Lord has become the kingdom. Let me say it again. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah. And he will reign forever and ever. Note that Christ will rule over the whole earth. Not only in this 1,000 years, but forever in the eternal order. Daniel 7 verses 13 and 14 explain. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days, that is God, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Paul underscores this in Colossians 1, 16 and 17. For in him, Jesus, all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all all things and in him all things hold together we go back to our friends in Acts 1 after receiving assurance from the heavenly messengers the apostles grasp the point that Christ the Messiah will return to earth to complete the establishment of the kingdom of God. Addressing a crowd in chapter 3 verse 21. Peter tells the crowd in Jerusalem. Who had just witnessed the dramatic arrival of the Holy Spirit. Or descent of the Holy Spirit. And Peter said heaven must receive him that is Jesus until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets Jesus must remain in heaven to allow a period of grace for mankind nearly 2000 years has elapsed since since Christ's burial resurrection and ascension God has a timetable and he's keeping Jesus in heaven to give everyone a chance at salvation and regeneration through the work of the Holy Spirit so today to our non-believing friends I echo the words of Peter in Acts chapter 3 verses 19 and 20. Repent then. And turn to God. So that your sins may be wiped out. That times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And that he may send the Messiah. Who has been appointed for you. Even Jesus. That messages for you unsafe friends now is the time of refreshing 
God has sent his Holy Spirit into the world. And his job is to regenerate and reborn. If you just heed his call when he knocks at your heart's door. Now is the time of refreshing rebirth and regeneration by the Holy Spirit. We implore you to make use of this opportunity. We're going to display a prayer on the screen. And if this morning you want to repent of your sins and to enter in a saving relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we're going to invite you at this time to just say that prayer. If you have said the prayer and you meant it, we're going to ask you to contact us at the email displayed or to call us or to WhatsApp us on the numbers displayed. To my fellow believers, like the apostles, our job is to be Christ's witnesses as we recruit others into the kingdom of God to build his bride of the church, to build a holy nation and a royal priesthood. Let us get on with this job so that we will increase the size and the number of persons, believers who will join the Lord when he returns and we will reign with him for his namesake.